everyone, and welcome to the Autism Now What podcast. Today, I am speaking to Jennifer Lucas from Texas. Is that correct, Jennifer? Yes, from Austin, Texas. Austin, Texas. It's so exciting to be speaking to you today. And um, just for everyone's information, Jennifer is a board certified behavior analyst. That's a BCBA. So I'm going to be asking her a lot of questions about what this credential actually means. Now, she's originally from Vietnam and she moved to California before she turned two. She lives in Austin, Texas, as she was saying, and she has a husband and two children. She has been working at the Center for Autism and Related Disorders since 2012. She started as a behavior technician, became an assistant supervisor for a couple of years, and has been a clinical supervisor since 2018. Jennifer regularly Zooms with our Star Academy instructors and our supervisors. She's responsible for our continued staff training. Jennifer is going to tell us more about her certification and why applied behavior analysis, that is ABA, is an effective option for autism. Jennifer, what prompted you to work with children with autism? So I fell on this upon this job on accident. Um, I was working at a university daycare. I had recently graduated um, and was ready to move on to the next part of my life, but I didn't really know what I wanted to do yet. Um, I honestly didn't even remember applying to CARD, um, but then I got a call to, inter to come in for an interview. That was back in, like you said, 20 2012. Um, I didn't know what I was getting myself into, but once I started doing therapy, I really fell in love with it. Um, I got to see firsthand how big of a difference it made in not only the child's life, but also the family's life. And I learned to really appreciate the little victories that we take for granted. Um, and so that's kind of what made me go from behavior technician and then um, go back to school to become a BCBA. So... And, and choosing psychology, why was that a choice for your university studies? Um, I first took a psychology class in high school, um, and I thought it was really interesting. Um, like I said, I didn't really know what I wanted to do um, as my career. I The only thing I knew was that I always wanted to work with children. Um, when I was little, I wanted to be a kindergarten teacher, um, or, you know, I went to jumping to a pediatrician and then jumped to, you know, want to be a child psychologist. I didn't really know what I wanted, but I just knew that it was with children. Um, and I felt like psychology was a good way to, um, I guess, buy myself some time to decide on what to do and, you know, just kind of understand child psychology a little bit more. Can you tell us what is Applied Behavior Analysis, ABA? Now, we know that that's rooted in the principles of psychology. What is ABA? Yeah, so um, ABA is a behavioral science. Um, so we use the learning theory, um, like respondent conditioning and all of that, that B.F. Skinner discovered, um, and other evidence-based practices that have that have been discovered over the years and apply it to um, change behavior in a socially significant way. So in, I guess, in simple terms, we teach appropriate behaviors and then try to decrease those inappropriate behaviors. Um, and the socially significant is really important because um, we want to make sure that we are working on behaviors that impact the individual's daily life. Um, for example, we wouldn't teach like a three-year-old what road signs are, but we would teach, let's say, a 15 or 16-year-old. Um, and we would, you know, definitely prefer to teach a three-year-old, you know, how to ask for a snack when they're hungry or um, how to play with toys. Many parents um, are under the impression that ABA is bad. What do you say to these parents? Um, that's definitely been a growing concern over the past few years. Um, and I definitely have had a lot of conversations about this with a lot of different people. And I usually just like to tell them, you know, just like how there are good teachers and bad teachers and how there are good doctors and bad doctors, ABA is just the same. 
um, you know, where you get ABA is very important. You know, you want a good company, a good BCBA, um, a company in BCBA with a lot of morals and puts a lot of importance in ethical practices. Um, it's important that, you know, as a parent, you feel comfortable with your team and believe that um, they really have your child's best interests in mind. Um, you know, this doesn't mean, though, that you're always or that they will always agree with you or that you will always agree with them. What it means, though, is that you guys that we work as a team and that we approach those difference in opinions um, in just a respectful way manner and have a, you know, a conversation about it. Um, ABA is also relatively new if you, you know, think about all the other sciences and psychology in general. There are a lot of ethical codes that we have now that really guide us in the right direction that weren't really there when ABA first started. And I think a lot of people who have had bad experiences with ABA in the past, unfortunately, experience, you know, probably you know, their experiences were, are valid and their um, opinions are valid, but, um, you know, I think the, we've tried to shift into, you know, a more um, ethical and, you know, understanding direction. Um, so that also means that it's important that we stay up to date with new research and um, understand that every treatment plan should be um, individualized to each person. And whenever possible, we want to make sure that we incorporate the person who's actually receiving ABA into the decision making process as well. Thank you for that. That's so interesting. Um, you know, I always tell parents also that ABA is an evidence based methodology. I know in America, it's endorsed by the American Academy of Pediatrics and the US Surgeon mm -hmm. General, covered in 52 states in America. Is that correct? Under medical yes. insurance? We don't yes. have medical insurance cover in South Africa yet. We are working on that, but we that don't have amazing. <laughs> we don't have that yet. Um, now what is you 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 mentioned a behavior technician. You know, a lot of parents in South Africa or professionals haven't even heard about ABA. And you've been talking about behavior technician, you've been talking about BCBA. Tell mm -hmm. us about a behavior technician. How can how in America can you um, acquire that accreditation, behavior technician? So behavior technician um, has usually has um, uh, either a, an accreditation with as a registered behavior technician, or um, you know another route they can have or they can go is to become a board certified autism technician. Um, basically what it means is that they've gone through rigorous um, training to learn how to do what they do. Um, you know, it requires watching videos to learn and understand what ABA is and then go through field work practice where they actually apply those skills under um, someone who is already, you know, a behavior technician training them and you know guiding them in the right direction and making sure that they pass the field work test as well. Um, so that's how you would become a behavior technician. Um, a, be a good way to explain what a behavior technician does is, you know, thinking of them as like a nurse. So they kind of work with the child's directly. Um, they collect data, they take notes, they actually implement the treatment. Um, they do not have the authority to make any changes to the treatment plan. Um, because that's not what their training is. However, they are really, really important in the therapy, therapy team when it comes to actually making like those a difference in a daily basis because they are working directly with the child um, every session. I understand. Okay. Now, um, a lot of, you know, I remember when I heard the words board certified behavior analyst for the first time. And now I've had experience with Association for Behavior Analysts International in America, which is an association um, that BCBAs be belong to and they disseminate information um, to the BCBAs. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I mean, am I correct in saying there are hundreds of thousands of BCBAs in America? Can you tell us more about that accreditation and are there universities that offer this accreditation? Who regulates a BCBA? Tell us about that. 
Yeah, so um, a BCBA is a graduate level certification um, that basically certifies um, individuals um, as practitioners who can um, provide behavior analytic services. Um, so to become a BCBA, you need to have a master's degree um, with an accredited university. Not all universities um, provide the right accreditation to become a BCBA. So you um, want to make sure that you are going to a university that specializes in it. Um, you have to have fieldwork experience um, that with a variety of topics such as like treatment planning, completing assessments, analyzing data, among other tasks um, that's covered in like a BCBA task list. And then after all of that, you apply to take an, a written exam and you have to pass that written exam, which, um, you know, it's there's a lot more resources now. So the pass rate's gotten a lot better, but I know in the past it was you know, about a 50% pass rate. Um, and wow. you know, the passing rate decreased the more you took it. Um, you have two years to, um, after you apply, you have two years to take it and you have eight attempts to take it before you would have to um, basically redo your whole training um, in order to, you know, go take it again. So, the exam, sorry, go ahead. So you need a master's degree to be able to yes. even qualify for a BCBA. So you said great uh, postgraduate level, meaning mm -hmm. you need a degree, an honors degree, and then a master's degree, and only then yes. can you apply to become a board certified behavior analyst, correct? Yes, correct. You okay. do need um, additional accreditation, correct. And then also um, in America, right? for insurance funding, a BCBA has to um, program for a child. You can't run a, a program without a BCBA, correct? Correct. In order to um, bill insurance, you have to, one, be a BCBA and two, um, actually meet their like each independent independent insurances like qualifications. Um, each state also has some states have their own um, rules in order for that you have to follow in order to become um, even practice in that specific state. Like New York has its a whole nother um, exam that you have to take and pass before you can provide any um, behavior analytic services in New York. In Texas. Um, it's not that difficult. You just have to show them proof of your um, your degree and the, that you pass the exam and then you become a licensed behavior analyst in Texas. But you do have to have all of that in order to even provide any services. We do not have, to my knowledge, a registered BCBA in the whole of South Africa. We do not have a university in South Africa that even offers the BCBA credential. So we are very fortunate that you, being a BCBA, um, do continued staff training for our staff at Star Academy, and that you also um, provide oversight on certain cases. Um, it's really so um, important for us to have access to you and to your expertise. Now, um, um, how does ABA attempt to reduce challenging behaviors? I talk to so many moms every day and they, I spoke to one mom this afternoon and she sounded so defeated by her child's behavior. When she called me, she said, this is the third school that he'd been kicked out of because of behavioral challenges. Um, so how does ABA attempt to reduce challenging behavior? Um, so we look at why a behavior is happening. Um, that's always the first step. Why is this child engaging in this problem behavior? Um, so for us, there's always four reasons. It's either um, for escape. So they're trying to get away from something. It is to get access to something. Um, so they want, um, you know, a toy, a food item, a location, whatever it is. Um, it could be for attention. So they're doing it for someone's attention and it's not always for positive attention. It can also be for negative attention. And then there's the last one where it's more sensory seeking. Um, we call that more automatic. Um, so we look at why it's happening and then um, we, 
try to teach a child to get what they want in just a more appropriate way. If it's for escape, we teach them to ask to be all done. We ask them to t ask for a break. We ask them to leave, um, or we teach them to ask to leave the room. Um, you know, it's for attention. Then we ask, teach them how to get someone's attention, tap their shoulder, say their name, um, you know, tell a joke, whatever it is. Um, so, um, you know, if they're screaming in, to get your attention, we'll teach them to say their, your name. Um, if they're hitting to get a break from work, like I said, we'll ask them to teach or we'll teach them to ask for a break. Um, and that could be using a device, using a picture system or vocally. Um, and then once we teach them a better way of getting their needs met, we, try to we start to teach them how to be more flexible about not always getting what they want, because I know that's difficult, you know, in, in life, you can't always get what you want. So we wanna make sure we're also teaching them that even though they are telling us that they want a break, maybe we just do one more, one more activity before they get that break. Um, so we wanna make sure they're flexible with that and that they learn to wait for what they want. Um, it is a gradual process. Um, it is not something that happens overnight. Um, and it's different for every child. You know, For some children, they will do it. They will decrease these behaviors um, very quickly. And then for others, it might take a little bit longer, but as long as everyone's on the same page and doing the same, doing everything consistently, then, um, it should decrease. Um, I always show parents the skills developmental curriculum and I always feel so proud when I show this curriculum because I always say that ABA tells us how to teach and the developmental curriculum actually tells us what, in, what skills to teach the child. We use the developmental curriculum skills at the Star Academy when we program for each individual child and you follow the same curriculum at CARD. Tell us more about skills and why this is a valuable tool for children on the spectrum. Yeah, so skills is, um, like you said, a, it's a comprehensive assessment and curriculum that can be used with um, essentially a you know, a newborn all the way up through adulthood. And I think that's what makes it so unique is um, a lot of, a lot, if not all other ABA programs have limitations on what age it can be applied to. Um, and, you know, skills does not, you know, we even have a skills adult program to focus on, you know, more of those adult life skills that, um, again, a lot of people don't think about when they're putting their three-year-old into ABA. Um, so skills itself, it also helps us create behavior intervention plans, um, and it is able to teach skills in all areas from language to social to academics, motor, and everything in between. Um, and it just allows you to customize everything to each child and, you know, compiles all that data into one database and, um, you know, you, someone collecting data in South Africa, it goes into the skills database and I can see it here in Texas. Um, so it allows us, you know, it's just, it really is amazing and definitely one of, one of a kind. I absolutely love skills and I enjoy so much that it allows for what this remote supervision. When my youngest son, Aaron, attended his ABA program, one of the clinicians at CARD would speak to us every week for an hour. And because of the skills developmental curriculum, we would have collected all his data for that week, how he was performing in his lesson programs, his language lessons, his adaptive skills lessons, social skills lessons and then she, every Monday she would analyze the data and we'd have a meeting and she would be able to direct us because mm -hmm. um, actually skills links to an app on the iPad called skills logbook so when my team were working with my son and in fact this is how it happens at the Star Academy when we work with each individual child we are actually logging the data of each lesson and then that allows the case supervisor to analyze the data and then to make strategic decisions on what strategies to follow in ABA or whether or not to move on to further targets. So, and what I love about skills um, is that it's, you know, it sets out all the skills according to age. So like mm -hmm. you can have a little two-year-old or a three-year-old and it's like, well, he's not talking. And then it's like, okay, let's look at skills. 
They need to imitate. They need joint attention. We need compliance. It really, really sets out. We don't need to think about, well, what are we going to teach this child? Skills exactly. tell them exactly what the child should be doing for their typical age. If they were two years old, these are all the developmental skills in all the developmental domains that they need to be, uh, that they need to have as a functional two-year-old. And when you turn three, skills will update all the developmental skills that you had to acquire in that year. I get excited when I talk about skills because I always say that ABA is a methodology and that's fine. We rely on ABA uh, how do we, for how do we motivate the child? How can we break down teaching the skill into a task analysis, for example? But the skills developmental curriculum, that is really, really magic. Yeah, and I think you make a good point that it breaks down each skill into each individual age. So again, we're making sure we're teaching something appropriate that another, like any other two or three year old should know. Um, and it also just makes sure that we're not jumping too far ahead. You know, there might be, there's obviously a million things that we can work on, but it really kind of helps us teach the basics and the foundational skills to make sure they, once we reach those more complex skills, they have it, they have all the skills in place to be able to um, master it. Now, um, why is it necessary to take data? Why is the data so important? Um, so the data really just lets us see if a treatment plan is working and whether we need to make any changes. Um, if it's not working, we know, you know, that we need to make a different change or modify it somehow to make sure it's working. And if it is working, then it shows us that we need to move on to the next step or make things more difficult. Um, as a BCBA, we unfortunately don't see the child every single day. So a lot of our decision making is based on the data. Um, data also doesn't lie. Um, and, you know, you don't have to worry about fatigue or personal bias of getting away with your decision making. Um, you know, we are all human. So emotion plays a big part into our decision making a lot of the time. And this kind of really helps us look at it just in a, in a purely, um, I guess, data driven way. And then, you know, we might not remember what a child's behavior was or skills were like a week ago or even a year ago, but the data will always be there for us to look at and, you know, to analyze accurately. I find it fascinating that we can have that data. And um, that's yeah. why ABA is a scientific methodology because we have that data to fall back on. It's, it's quite phenomenal. Now, um, you know, at Star Academy, we have we have a team of schedulers and they are often in tears because we want to please every parent and parents always have their most favorite ABA therapists on the team. In South Africa, we actually call the ABA therapists instructors. Now, uh, parents often prefer a particular instructor. I only want this person. Can you tell us why it's important to have more than one ABA therapist instructor on a team? Yeah, um, it's really good when your child works well with a specific instructor, um, since the relationship is such an important part of the decision um, or in making progress. Um, however, you know, again, in life, change happens all the time, you know, you'll go move on to the next grade and have a new teacher. Um, you know, your coworkers and bosses will always change. So it's important that you're able to adapt um, and adjust to those changes. So we try to replicate real life as much as possible in ABA. Um, so that's why, you know, having more than one instructor on a team is important. And also having team changes is important. Um, you know, it's important that your child is able to ask for a snack from not just their favorite instructor, but also from their teachers at school, um, or if they're at a restaurant, being able to order food, um, or, you know, if they're on a play date, being able to ask their um, friends or, you know, their, you know, the friend's parents for a snack. Um, and that's not something that they can realistically do if they're only practicing that skill with one person. Yes, absolutely. Um, I remember when my son Aaron, who um, really, he was in ABA for seven hours a day for four years. And I remember at one point in his program, 
that we would actually make a point of scheduling a new instructor once or twice a week, someone he never met before, so that he would generalize his skills and that he would be forced to adapt and really to help him with flexibility because the world, it, this life is fast paced and things change all the time. And it was so important towards the end of Erin's um, intensive ABA program that we actually made, um, made him get used to new ABA therapists, instructors, um, and it helped him a lot. Um, and sometimes, you know, kids can get upset because they are inflexible. Um, and, and I think the parents get upset because they just want the, their children happy, but the kids will be okay, right? <laughs> Yeah, yes. Um, you know, like you said, life happens very quickly and you can't plan for all of the changes that's going to happen in your day to day life. So, you know, one of the things that we can work on is their flexibility with, you know, new people. Um, and that is a core autism symptom is inflexibility to routine changes. So it is important that we factor that in because we want ABA, like I said, to replicate real life as much as possible um, to make sure they are actually successful in their ABA program in applying what they're learning in their natural environment. So it's like, if you're not good at something, the more you practice that something that you're not good at, the better you're going to yes. get at it, right? So the more yes. inflexible you are, the more you're exposed to change, the better you're going to become at that because you're practicing to adapt yes. because things can change very quickly. Like at school, the yes. teacher may have scheduled library for first morning on a Friday, but now it's raining, she can't get to the library, they're gonna to have to do math before library and the child can't have a meltdown. So things are changing all the time. And we also teach emotional regulation mm -hmm. um, in an ABA program as well, because that links to the flexibility, correct? Yes, um, emotional regulation for sure, you know, um, being able to recognizing when you're getting upset or when you are upset and you know how to, regulate your emotions to where you're, you know, maybe not having a full meltdown, like it's okay to still get upset about these changes, but it's really just making sure that it's not impacting your daily life. And I do want to say, especially with, you know, the state of our world right now with coronavirus, you know, teachers get sick, people get sick, and, you know, there's going to be substitutes um, who kind of jump in that the child's not used to. And so that's, you know, another factor that we want to think about when you know there are team changes in an ABA team. And I, I always um, remind parents also that we have a pool of trained ABA instructors to draw from. So we can very quickly draw from our pool of staff and put mm -hmm. someone in place. And it's more important for that child to continue their hours of ABA. And I haven't even really asked you this, but why seven hours a day of ABA? Like, seven hours a day is my child going to be able to concentrate for seven hours a day he's 18 months how on earth is he going to cope for seven hours a day yeah seven hours a day definitely sounds like a lot of work um you know but you also have to remember they are um you know going to be going to school for seven hours a day um in the future so School is going to be a lot more intense, you know, whereas during like a full time um, program with ABA, we are, you know, we incorporate a lot of natural activities, play activities. So, you know, they're not sitting at a table for seven hours a day, you know, doing work the entire time, you know, they're going, you know, to different rooms, like they're going outside to work, you know, on their motor skills, they're eating lunch, they're eating snack with their peers. Um, so that definitely, hopefully will kind of help ease that a little bit. But, um, you know, just as a two year old, you are only behind in skills by certain, you know, by two years. And so, you know, during those first few years, we want to make sure that when they're only, you know, behind by however many years, they're able to um, 
you know, catch up with their peers as much as possible. So when they do go to school, you know, they're only, you know, if they are behind, you know, not behind as much as, you know, if they hadn't gotten ABA for um, seven hours a day. I always explain to parents that when a child is delayed, they need to make more than a year's development in a year. Every day, their peers are developing and learning skills. Mm -hmm. And so they're behind. So not only do they need to catch up, their peers are developing every single day. So they need to make more than a year's development in a year. And that's why we need the number of hours. And as you explained, we don't, we focus on all areas of development. So even if we get a two-year-old, it's going to be looking at their adaptive skills and whether or not we need to teach them to eat with a spoon. We, um, if they're going to be three years old, we're already looking at toileting skills. In mm -hmm. language domain, we're looking at their communication, executive functioning skills, play skills. We need a lot of time to cover all the developmental skills that they need in order for us to catch them up. And so what I also liked about what you said is we're not just sitting them at a table and drilling them um, in a rote fashion. We can sit on the floor, we can do ABA outside, ABA can also be delivered at another school where we facilitate, mm -hmm. but then we have very specific school goals. Um, and so time goes very fast when you have, you know, a number of skills to catch up on. Now, um, we often talk about an extinction burst relating to behavior in ABA. I remember when my oldest son, David, who's now 20, <laughs> He had massive extinction bursts in his first ABA program. And I cried a lot about that. Like I used to sit outside the room with my little prayer book and my heart broke into a million pieces that he was so upset. And, you know, parents tend to become concerned when they hear their child crying. It's only normal to want to console your child. What advice do you have to offer? Yeah, like you said, it is absolutely normal to want to console your child. As a parent, that's your main job is, you know, to make sure they're happy and healthy. Um, so it's hard as a parent to think about the future when in the moment your child is so upset, but you really want to ask yourself, if my child is reacting this way, you know, as a teenager or as an adult, would that be okay? Um, because, you know, if they aren't learning the skills to replace that extinction burst, it's going to continue um, into adulthood. And at that point, it's even harder to manage um, that type of behavior. So most of the time, the discomfort, um, that temporary discomfort and heartbreak does pay off in the future. Um, but, you know, there are still parents who aren't quite ready for that step yet. So I think it's also important to talk to the supervisor about, you know, how to better manage that extinction as a parent. Um, you know, maybe it's making sure that we're only doing a specific lesson at the center and not at home or, you know, letting parents know ahead of time, we're about to sit down and read a book. And, you know, we know that your child doesn't really like reading a book, but, so they might cry, um, you know, just kind of preparing parents ahead of time um, so they, you know, can hopefully be a little bit more okay with their child being so set, upset. But again, like at the end of the day, as a parent, you're, you know, you guys get a say in how we do things. So if you're not ready for it yet, you know, talk to the supervisor, but it eventually does pay off. I always tell parents that, when you hear your child crying, we you automatically think that yes. they, they're in pain or they are in distress. But if they don't have another means to communicate and they don't, mm -hmm. even if they two by two, many children have double words, right? They should yeah. have double words and that's how they should be communicating in at least two word phrases. Now, if they are not capable of that level of communication, they're going to cry and scream um, to communicate. And that doesn't necessarily mean that they're in pain or that they are distressed. It just mean that means that that's how they've now learned to communicate. And in the ABA program, we're working on teaching them the developmental skills to repl replace the crying and screaming. And I love what you said because it's not going to go away. Unless we teach replacement behavior and have the time in ABA 
um, you know, to, to teach the communication and language skills that they're missing, you're going to have a teenager who's banging his head against the wall. I experienced that with my oldest son, David. I mean, his teenage years were the worst. They were so bad that I had to write a book <laughs> because I had to let other people know what we went through. It was really, really so hard. He would hit his head. He would um, fall down on the floor and kick and scream and bite and spit. So the sooner we can, you know, it's much easier to work with a younger child who's two or three years old and um, they may cry for a certain period of time, but then they'll soon start to realize that when I communicate in a certain and appropriate way, I'm going to get my needs met. But I do agree with you. You as a parent have to be in the right space to handle it and to receive that intervention. It's, it, it's not going to be for everyone. Um, now, we actually, I wanted to ask you, what is the role of a supervisor? Because at Star Academy, every child gets a case supervisor and then a team of instructors that implement the program. And I love how you used uh, the word nurse because I also explained to parents that the supervisor is like a doctor who's deciding on the ABA strategy and which skills to teach. And then the ABA instructors implement the program. Sometimes parents will say, but why do I need this? supervisor I don't want them and in South Africa we have uh, to have a minimum of four hours of supervision every month once the case has been designed but in America I'd love to hear what the minimum supervision required is on your cases at card and and tell me more about the role of a case supervisor yeah, so the supervisor, like you said, comes up with a treatment plan that helps reduce the problem behaviors and teach those important skills. Um, we work with the families directly to decide um, what behaviors we want to work on and what skills we want to work on. Um, you know, the you know, they, the supervisor trains families as well and trains the instructors on the individual treatment plan. Um, you know, they make the changes. They're the one that is able to create and make and adjust the treatment plan um, because they have that additional training to analyze data and determine what changes need to be made. Um, so the supervisor is incredibly important. Even you know, though they might not be working with the child directly, they they have that expertise and training to know which way to take the treatment plan and, um, you know, know how to work together as a team with the child, the family, and the instructors to make sure that it's all going in the right direction. As for supervision, in, for us, we try to aim for 10 to 20 percent um, supervision to therapy percentage. So that means that a child with 40 hours of therapy a week should get about four to eight hours of supervision a week as well. Wow. Um, and you know, so yes. That means that a child who's doing seven hours a day is getting four hours a week. We're talking about 12 hours a month of supervision. Yes, yes. Um, so, wow. right. Because there's just that treatment plan is a lot more comprehensive and requires more analyzing data, more training, uh, like with the behavior or the instructors. Um, so that's why that's so high um, versus, you know, if someone's receiving like 10 hours of therapy a week, that's about four hours a month mm -hmm. um, because there's not as much time or not as much data to analyze in, you know, decision making that needs to be made. Um, I will say, though, again, every child just be just like how every child gets an individualized treatment plan, um, you know, the number of supervision is also very different for each child. You know, maybe a child with 10 hours a week might get as much as a child, um, as much supervision as a child that's getting 20 to 30 hours a week, depending on that specific child, if they have a lot of behaviors um, or if they're progressing through their programs really quickly, um, you know, it's really, really dependent on the child, but we do aim for that 10 to 20%. It's so interesting to hear what you do in America because it's so difficult for us to even cover four hours of supervision because, right. um, because there is no funding. So the more supervision, 
the, the, the more it's going to cost the parent. And so, wow, 12 hours a month of supervision is just something that we can absolutely strive for. Now, um, when does a child require an augmentative communication device? If we put a device in place for communication, does this mean that they're not going to speak vocally? My oldest son, David, he uses an iPad with touch chat um, to communicate, and he actually really does so he communicates very successfully on the device. At what age would you start considering a device? And, you know, I know parents are like so worried when we say communication device, well, now my child's not going to speak vocally. What, what, what advice do you have to offer on that? I would say the earlier, the better. Um, just remember, you know, that communication device is a way for them to just express their needs um, that, you know, they were expressing either one, they weren't able to express at all or two, using those problem behaviors to communicate what they're wanting. Um, so it really just, you know, it helps a child who has limited vocal abilities to still communicate. I just imagine myself if I was hungry or if I wanted a specific, um, if I wanted to watch a movie um, or, you know, wanted to go somewhere and I had no way to get access to it, you know, that would be frustrating because it would be something that I would have to deal with 24-7. Um, so communication isn't the only way to fix a problem behavior, but it makes it so much more manageable because a child is getting their needs met. Um, you know, not all children will, will be able to speak vocally, you know, as much as we might want that to happen. There are a lot of factors that go into it. Um, you know, if they have a speech impediment or, you know, something like apraxia, that's, that definitely affects their ability to speak vocally. So at the very least for those children, we want them to be able to express their needs in whatever way they can. Um, you know, as a basic human right, you have to be able to tell people, you know, some of the, like when you're hungry and um, tired and all of that. Um, you know, for others, they might have some vocal speech, but maybe it's not clear. So not everyone understands it. Um, or maybe they, you know, have difficulty coming up with the right words. Um, a device can really help supplement their vocal language, um, especially for those who are visual learners, being able to see what it is um, helps them kind of tell you what exactly they want, even though in their head they might know what it is, they might not be able to actually say it out loud. So that device kind of is that little bridge to gap that. Um, because the device repeats the word every time um, you press an icon, they hear it every single time. Um, it's a machine, so it says the word the same way every single time. So it's actually more consistent than if we're prompting them to say the same word. Yeah. The other issue with us prompting them is that they're dependent on us to tell them what to say, whereas this device, it's there and they can use it spontaneously and as independently as they need to. Um, so we've actually seen that, you know, a device increases a child's vocal language because of all these extra factors. And just because we're using a device doesn't mean that we're not still working on their vocal language. Um, it just means that, you know, they're able to get their needs met while we continue to practice and work on their vocal language. I love what you said there is they getting their needs met while we're practicing their vocal language and practicing vocal language when you have an apraxia, which is a speech motor challenge, takes time. Um, my son David, who's 20 and has autism, had probably the worst form of apraxia. And because we gave him a communication device, it did not mean that we ever gave up on his vocal speech. He is capable of saying some words vocally and he uses some words vocally they have to be very simple short words that he can say vocally he even acquired certain vocal words when he was 12 and 13 I'll never forget that he could only say s and the sound sh sh when he was 12 and 13 actually and when he could do s and sh then we could practice words like C or one of his mm -hmm. instructors, her name was Ashley, so he could call her Ash. But he had a communication device in place for many, many years, and he can tell us many, many, many things through that communication exactly. device. You probably have many stories to share with us, but we had a child that we worked with um, who was completely non-vocal, really the also very severely apra a severe apraxia. 
And this child did so well with the communication device that he was coping with the foundation phase um, academics at school. We would facilitate him at school. He could handle a great curriculum successfully and have a beautiful conversation through the communication device even though his vocal speech was so impaired. He would tell them about dolphins and he would tell them about what he, um, what he thought about dolphins swimming in the sea, like a high level conversation through yeah. a communication device. You know, my son David doesn't have that high level conversation through a communication device. He'll only communicate for his basic needs um, through the device, but he still tells us a lot of things like, when, where he wants to go on holiday and what he wants to do on holiday and what he wants to eat. And he'll ask me on the device things that matter to him. When is his dad coming home? They all love their dad. Um, <laughs> I'm the sergeant major. I run an army camp in my house. They've all accepted that. But <laughs> they love their dad. So he'll be like, where's Martin? And he'll ask on the device. And the, the, he'll, he'll tell me about B-movie that he's watching. And he'll say... Hi, mom, he'll say B movie, and then I'll put it on. And then he'll say, the B got stuck on the ball in the rain. And he actually types right. that on his iPad, which is, you know, quite a sentence. He does, though, like I said, only tell me about what interests him. But we, he really knows how to elicit a smile uh, from us because sometimes we really grin at what he's able to tell us on the device um, and we wouldn't know what's going on in his mind if if he didn't have that means of communication so it's very important and like you said we never give up on vocal production we really don't um, and an ABA program is always going to cover that motor piece the mo that is that apraxia piece when we walk, we motor plan. When we speak, we motor plan. So we have to practice the oral motor and the motor area. We have to, um, you know, be, get the kids to echo the different sounds, blends before we get to words. Um, and yeah, I agree with you. Once you give them the iPad, the iPad is a machine that says the word the same way every time. And research shows that children actually acquire vocal speech much faster when you give them that communication program. And one more thing with a communication device, if you're three years old and you can't say, leave me or leave me alone, or I want to go to the toilet, or can I, can I play in the garden? You're going to engage in inappropriate behavior like hitting your head, kicking, biting, spitting. So the sooner we can put that device in place, you know, we're going to prevent those kind of behaviors from emerging. Yes. And then, you know, the later, it's never too late to work on it, but the later you work you put a device in place, the longer the child has to learn that those problem behaviors are going to get them what they want, which means that it's going to take a little longer for them to unlearn that behavior and relearn how to do it, the, you know, a different way using that device or vocal language if it starts to emerge. So um, I agree with that because um, parents, I'll speak to parents of a 10 year old and they'll say, well, how long will my child have to be on the program? And I'll say, well, he's now engaging in X, Y, Z behaviors. He's been behaving in this way for 10 years. It's going to take a lot longer to undo those behaviors because he's been, been behaving in that way to communicate for a very, very long time. So it takes much longer when they're older to teach them a replacement behavior. Not that it can't be done. It absolutely can be done. And ABA is relevant to all children across the spectrum, which brings me to the next question, which was, how do you address social skills deficits? Can an ABA program improve a child's social skills? Yes, we um, absolutely can work on social skills. Um, I mean, that's the one of the main deficits of autism, right, is that um, the child has a lot of social deficits. Um, you know, social skills is hard enough for a neurotypical person, let alone, um, you know, someone with autism. Um, you know, neurotypicals learn through observation, whereas, you know, those with autism might need to be taught 
these social skills um, directly instead. So we can teach social rules that um, many autistic individuals do well with. They do really, really well when it's black and white and it's presented as a rule. We can also break down like a complex social skill into smaller components and then, um, you know, teach each component of that social skill individually, and then, you know, have them kind of put it all together once they've mastered um, all individual components. Um, we can also, you know, just be a safe place for them to practice their social skills um, so that when they are around their families, peers, and out in the community, they, um, you know, they might not be as nervous to to use whatever skills um, that they need to use. So the end goal is always for them to be able to apply their skills in the natural environment. So um, you know that's what we also have to kind of plan for as well. When I, every time I show a parent the social skills domain in the skills program, I get excited because it's gonna teach your child about how to pick up social cues, how to start a conversation, end a conversation, initiate a conversation, learning through observation, how to make a joke, how to take a joke, understanding the intentions of others, um, and learning social rules. What is appropriate to do at home? What's appropriate to do out in the community or at school? The social skills uh, curriculum in the skills um, developmental curriculum is extensive and, um, it really goes a long way to address social skills deficits. Now, children with autism can be picky eaters. Um, I know you also speak to so many moms who are pulling their hair out because, you know, the, the kids kind of get your back up in a corner because they'll like McDonald's, 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 yes. and they will just not touch uh, any nutritious food. And we know that nutrition is so important uh, for children on the spectrum, correcting vitamin and mineral deficiencies is, is, is critical to treatment. So how can an ABA program address these challenges? Um, so yes, first we want to make sure there, again, there's no medical reasons for it, um, whether there's, you know, just sometimes like speech, um, there's some like speech delays and things that are caused by medical reasons and same with like feeding, um, whether it's, you know, not being able to chew the, a certain texture um, or whatever it is. So we have to clear that, you know, rule that out. But then after we've ruled that out, we can work on desensitizing the child to specific textures, smells, um, colors, types of foods, all of that. Um, and again, work on it slowly at it, like, you know, just do it slowly. Um, it's that desensitization where, you know, the way I usually teach it is that they just have to be okay with it being on the plate. It depends on how intense, you know, their aversion is to the food, but sometimes it's just starting with it being on the same plate. Um, and then we work on, you know, them being able to touch it and then being able to, you know, pick it up, put it close to their nose and smell it, put it close to the mouth and just like outside of their mouth or on their lips, then lick it. You know, we work our way slowly up to them being able to take a bite of it. Throughout all of this, they're getting reinforced by the their preferred foods. Um, we want to condition them to learn that, you know, when I do this with a food that I don't like, I get a food that I like. And, you know, over time, your brain does learn to associate, you know, the two foods together. And hopefully, you know, that will help them eventually pick up at least more, a wider range of foods and not be as picky. You know, we they might not be able to, you know, just eat all kinds of fruits and vegetables in all food groups, but hopefully it expands the horizons enough to where they're eating enough um, different types of foods or, um, you know, be willing to try different types of foods more willingly without getting so upset. That's such a good explanation. And we've had a lot of success in our ABA programs in introducing children to new foods. In fact, today, I was speaking to a dad um, whose son is enrolled on our program. And he said, Ilana, I just want to thank you because we can now take our child for a haircut, actually. He said that you were working on desensitizing him. And he was very afraid of the clippers. And so in the ABA program, we got a pair of clippers and we just let him touch it and play with it and tolerate it just on his skin. And then um, for longer periods of time and in an ABA program, no matter what the challenge is, we can work on desensitization. And that's a piece that also comes in when we 
help the children to learn to eat a variety of foods. And th this is a huge piece. It's a huge piece because part of the reasons I always say that we see autism symptoms and the research shows is because they, they are deficit in essential vitamins and minerals that they need for proper brain function. That if you can't get your child to eat, what are you meant to do? And so meal times really do, does need to be a pleasant experience. My oldest son, David, he used to hold us hostage. So he used to eat, if we presented something he didn't like, he'd throw up. And then I'd clean it up and I'd have to cook the food again and I'd present it again and he'd throw up again and I'd present it again. And then he threw up again, <laughs> cleaned a lot of vomit in my arm. I could get the badge. I know how to clean vomit. <laughs> I cleaned a lot of vomit, like, but we persevered and um, I learned from, you know, Card and the clinicians I was exposed to over the years that mealtimes really should be a pleasant experience. So I find it very reassuring to know that you can actually rely on an ABA program to systematically and very strategically introduce new foods um, to help the child um, eat a better and more nutritious diet. Now, potty training, big one. Will yes. my child potty train? I always say to the parents, we will get them to potty train. Tell us more about potty training. Yeah, so potty training is a, is one of those milestones that you want that we want all of our children to hit. Um, there are a lot of prerequisite skills that come in or that are required to make sure um, you know the child can successfully potty train. So we want to make sure that the child has those prerequisite skills first. Um, some things is just making sure they're you know able to stay dry for um, you know at least an hour. Um, you know, start to show, like, be able to sit on a toilet, even, like, even if they're not able to potty train, make sure that they're able to, like, that compliance of being able to sit on the toilet, so we can even successfully toilet train. Um, so we, one, we want to make sure they have those prerequisite skills. Two, you know, before we start, we want to make sure we have a meeting with the parents um, to talk about what the right toileting procedure is for the child, because again, every child is going to be different and every parent is going to be different. Um, you know, what might work for one child isn't going to necessarily work for another. And what might, what one parent can do doesn't necessarily mean that another parent can do. So we want to make sure everyone's on the same page, um, before we get started on it. Um, you know, making sure the schedules, the, you know, we're all on the same page with the schedule. We have a reinforcer in place. Everyone understands like, you know, how to implement it because we do need that consistency during the first week or two um, of potty training. And then, um, you know, ideally we'll, we'll be able to get it done within that week or two and then, you know, be able to move on to a less intense potty training schedule and routine. But yes, it's absolutely something that we can work on in ABA, but it is very intense. One of you know, the most intense procedure or protocol that we can do. Mm. Uh, my son, David, um, who has autism, only potty trained when he was seven. And that's when I actually met Dr. Doreen Grandpachet, who's your founding director of the Center for Autism and Related Disorders. And she sends of the card clinicians to South Africa and they help potty train him very, very quickly. I always say if David could potty train, then any child can potty train because he is profoundly autistic. And I do agree with you that, again, that's where the skills curriculum comes in because those prerequisite skills need to be in place. And it really depends on every individual child because with some children, they can be afraid of sitting on the toilet and you have to maybe start on a potty. And so I think it's so wonderful that we can have um, a case supervisor or in your case, BCBAs that are actually, you know, working on this. It's just simply amazing. And I think the bottom line here and the message is that ABA is working towards teaching children functional skills so that they can become independent human beings yes exactly um exactly and um you know the skills program is very like you said very crucial in determining that but i also think thinking about the function of the behavior is also important like why 
is potty training difficult for a child because um, you know, a child, if a child is scared of sitting on the toilet, how we would approach that is different than a child who um, just doesn't understand the concept of going in the, in the bathroom as well. So um, yeah. I think that's all very important for sure. What was so comforting for me when I had my ABA team to toilet train David is that I had this whole team of people working towards achieving David's potty training. So yes. that's really what you're going to get when you enroll on an ABA program. Now, um, parents don't always want to remove their child from school and place them in an ABA program instead. They feel that they need interaction with other children. Which prerequisite skills need to be in place in order to ensure a child's success in a school setting? Yeah, I would say the top priorities um, are compliance, you know, having those basic compliance skills um, and also having enough receptive language skills to be able to understand the instructions so they can even comply with the instructions. Um, being able to work on their attention skill, you know, for them to be able to sit and focus on the teacher or the lesson plan or whatever it is that they're working on. Um, and then have a way to communicate their needs as well. Um, those are all the main priorities that they would have to, um, or the main um, prerequisite skills that they would have to have that we would like to see before a child, you know, go into a school setting. And, you know, the quickest way to teach the skills would be in a one-on-one, one-on-one setting, which isn't always possible in schools. Um, you know, another thing is, you know, if we want to make sure they can engage or they can, you know, participate in peer play. If a child you know, is all aggressive towards their peers, you know, putting them into a school with the peers isn't, might not always lead to the best results. So we want to make sure we're working on decreasing those problem behaviors as well. So they can build a relationship with their peers. Um, at the end of the day, our goal is to teach them the skills to be in successful in schools and not to keep them out of school. It's just that, you know, again, sometimes they have to work on, you know, those skills before you know we get them to that point yeah. I agree I agree on everything that you said with my younger son Aaron um, when he had the prerequisite skills in place we would then send a trained facilitator with him to school and that's where we implemented his ABA program at that point so ABA can really be implemented in different settings I also agree that if a child requires one-on-one -on -one, uh, facilitation they do need time one-on-one -on -one so that we can teach those skills that they need. When you're in the classroom, you can then work on the generalization of those skills, correct? But you do need that one-on-one -on -one time. With two-year-olds and three-year-olds, I also think what's important is just getting their imitation skills in place because a two-year-old learns um, because they can imitate. They imitate their peers, right? And so if their imitation skills are not fluent, they're not going to be successful at school. I remember when my youngest son, Aaron, was in the ABA program and we were really working so hard to get him to school. We were pushing his imitation skills because I knew that's how he was going to learn play sequences and th that's how he was going to learn to imitate his peers. And actually, that's how we learn language, right? Is because... Um, and yeah. we imitate, but I love how you listed the prerequisite skills for school. And if the kids don't have that yet, it doesn't mean that they're not going to acquire those skills. That's why we have the ABA program so that we can work towards that skill acquisition and at some point get them back into school. But I think if you place a child in school who's not ready for school, you really are wasting their time because they, they're not able to learn from their natural environment. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. So now, um, yeah, a very important question for you. And I know a lot of moms are very anxious about whether or not their child will speak. Have you actually experienced children who are non-vocal learn to speak vocally? Yes, I definitely have. Um, right now, I have a five-year-old who came to us when he was a little under three. Um, when he first came to us, he played quietly. Um, you know, really only played by himself. Um, sometimes he would make car sounds because he loves to play with cars. Um, and really he cried anytime something didn't go his way. Um, 
we the first consistent sound we were able to get him to make was the ah sound so he used that for everything like if he wanted to leave if he wanted a car if he wanted to eat it was ah um because that wasn't realistic for you know once we started working with him we knew exactly what he wanted but we knew that wasn't realistic for other people to understand him um so we introduced um an iconic system to get him to at least be able to tell us what it is that he wanted so we could work on you know teaching him the vocabulary skills um we also started working on like started pairing um you know, anytime he, we talked to him and he made any sound in return, we would, you know, give him a lot of praise, let him play with cars. So we started pairing that, you know, responding to someone vocally is going to get him what he wants. And we were able to slowly work our way up to, you know, getting him to say, ah, when we wanted him to, and then getting him to make specific, like other sounds. And then we were able to get him to make it to words. And now, um, we he's able to make vocal requests um he can use phrases he um can comment on his environment he makes some very appropriate attacks that um you know a lot of typical kids would make um and you know this is a kid who three years ago had no functional language at all so it's really been amazing to see him go from you know a kid who made car sounds to someone who can tell us that he wants to play with a police car or that he wants to build a garage for his cars or, you know, again, you know, commenting on how, you know, this is his favorite car. Um, so yes, definitely have experienced that. And it is one of the most amazing things about ABA is being able to experience a child go from non-vocal to vocal. Uh experienced many children in the Star Academy on the Star Academy program who have acquired vocal speech. Not every child will. ABA yeah. is not a magic one that's going to ensure that every single child does acquire vocal speech, but you know, you're definitely going to have an expert team fighting in your corner to help your child acquire that skill. My youngest son, Aaron, could not imitate. He could not make a single sound. He is an absolute miracle. He had severe apraxia. Um, when he started to imitate sounds, he looked like a stroke patient because the sound would come through one side of his mouth. We could see how his facial muscles were disproportionate. He would say "bah" through the one side corner of his lips. We had to work on every single consonant, vowel, blend, it was, the mission was very fragile, but through a lot of hours, oral motor exercises, um, working on it, all the prerequisite skills that come before vocal imitation. I mean, you can't just jump straight into vocal imitation. Yeah. Again, that's where skills comes in because you, the child has to be able to imitate gross motor um, as well as actions with objects. And so um, we really were pushed imitation with Aaron. And today, Aaron has a very fluent conversation. We also have parents sometimes who have children who have echolalia, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so ABA can help those kids as well. Jennifer, how would you program for a child with echolalia? Um, honestly, I would use that echolalia to our advantage, um, you know, teach them to repeat appropriate phrases um, or repeat those phrases in the right context. Like, you know, them having echolalia is actually a good sign because it means that they have vocal abilities and they have the ability to imitate. Um, so we, again, just try to shift that you know, echolalia to something more functional, being able to ask for what they want, um, being able to, um, you know, have a conversation. But it, you know, it definitely requires that shaping of, okay, first, let's start small, let's maybe work on, you know, just repeating one thing, um, or one phrase. And then, you know, teaching them to, to, use a previously learned phrase to respond to what we're saying instead of just repeating what we're saying. 
Um, but I feel like echolalia is not necessarily a bad thing because like I said, it means that they have that ability to imitate vocal language. Um, I agree with you. I think when a child has echolalia, it's like 50% of the battle won because they can mm -hmm. already imitate. It doesn't mean that a child who can't imitate can't learn to imitate, but if Absolutely, they can yeah. imitate, you know, um, it's definitely possible to get in there and tap into the echolalia to get them to a place where they can have a comprehensive uh, conversation. Now, um, can ABA really improve a child's attention skills? Yes. Um, again, we use, you know, what we call shaping. We start very small. Sometimes we have them pay attention to one thing for even just one to three seconds. That's, that's where we start, depending on where the child is. And, you know, they pay attention to that one thing for that, even that one second, and we reward them give them breaks, give them rewards. And once they're able to consistently do that, we move it up slower or like, you know, slowly we increase it to where, you know, ideally they would be able to pay, sit and pay attention to whatever it is um, for longer periods of time. We also kind of, um, you know, make sure we're very um, intentional with what we're using. Maybe we start with things that um, they enjoy and being able to sit and pay attention to things that they enjoy, but ne not necessarily, you know, at a table. Um, and then we move our way up to, again, things that are non-preferred and being able to sit and read a book or do some homework. Um, but yes, we can definitely work on attention. And, you know, we can work on paying attention to non-social things like, again, a book or a toy, but also to social things, paying attention to other people. So again, when they are in school, they can pay attention to their teacher who is talking. I love how you explained that. Uh, I also love how skills breaks down the different kinds of yes. attention that you can have sustained. You have to first know how to shift your attention before you can sustain your attention mm -hmm. and then later on um, divide your attention. And those are different skills. And I think yes. it was so fascinating for me to understand that. Uh, there's also joint attention, which is actually in the social skills domain. Mm -hmm. The shifting attention, sustained attention, and divided attention is in the executive functioning domain. So it was so interesting for me to learn about all the different kinds of attention and why uh, the, those skills were important for success in a classroom. And I have seen um, it possible to teach those skills and how we do that is to rely on the principles of ABA and on reinforcement and slowly just increasing the increments of time that you're expecting that child to sustain or divide their attention. Um, now, a lot of parents are not getting a good night's sleep. I actually spoke to a 22 month old, uh, a parent of a 22 month old child today. She was very, very sad and worried because she was picking up the red flags to autism. And she said, Ilana, he wakes up at two o'clock in the morning and that's it. Okay. Can ABA help uh, to get these kids to fall to sleep and to stay to sleep? Yes. I, I feel like I'm a broken record when I say this, but again, we always have to rule out the medical causes of it because again, ABA, as amazing as it is, cannot cure medical um, problems. Um, so, you know, we have to rule that out. And then, you know, really we approach sleeping as a behavior. So we would conduct probably a functional behavior assessment where we would look at what's happening before they're going to sleep or while they're supposed to be going to sleep, look at the environment, see if there's any triggers or factors that could be causing them to, um, you know, not fall asleep very quickly or fall asleep, you know, take a long time to fall asleep. We look at how they're sleeping, you know, the, you know, whether they're sleeping peacefully once they do fall asleep, um, if they're waking up frequently, you know, all of that. And then we also look at what happens after, what happens when they're waking up, because that, you know, putting all of that information together will tell us how to address sleep behaviors. You know, some kids need, you know, just some, like, just need a simple routine created as before they go to sleep so they can train their body to, you know, understand that it's time to sleep. Some kids wake up 
and they know that they get to play when they wake up or they know that you know they get some extra snuggle times with parents and so that's why they wake up and stay awake so we really have to look at you know all of the environmental factors and then once we determine that and or get that information then we can really come up with a plan to help with sleep that's very um, encouraging to know that you actually can come up with a, a plan for, for sleep. Now, just from having looked for treatment options um, for David, who kept us awake for many years, I will share from the medical side, just as a parent, because I'm not a doctor and parents must be guided by their doctor, but what I have learned is some of the medical reasons for a child waking up in the middle of the night or not sleeping through the night can be acid reflux. I would also check if that child possibly has an ear infection. If there is a yeast infection in the gut, that can be something that can keep a child up at night. And also um, deficient vitamins or minerals, for example, David was very deficient in vitamin B6. And once we started to supplement vitamin B6 in very, very high doses, and I mean high doses, um, he would sleep through the night. But now, you know, don't run and give your child vitamin B6. Every child is an individual and can be missing different vitamins or minerals. Like many children that don't sleep through the night can be deficient in magnesium. So you really do need to do testing and determine if your child is deficient. And then, you know, to supplement those deficiencies can help. Sometimes they're just hungry and they've actually just yeah. run out. They, they, have, they can run out of um, feeling full much faster than a typically developing child. And so they maybe need something to eat to settle them. I mean, I learned that about my son and that's linked to their mitochondria. So the mitochondria is the engine of the cell. And, you know, if you are um, following about medical treatment protocol, a lot of the doctors will assess the child's mitochondria. That's the engine of the cell. That's something you can discuss with your doctor. I think it's also important just to check what you are giving your child to drink if they're waking up at two o'clock in the morning, because if you're giving them a milk bottle, I would imagine that that could be contributing to the autism symptoms because a lot of children do do well when you remove food allergies, including gluten, dairy, soya, sugar. Um, and, you know, if you can find a formula that is a rice-based protein shake, but consult your pediatrician and find out, you know, what um, formula will work for your child, especially when they're still small, they're two years old or they're three years old and they're wanting a bottle in the middle of the night. But I think addressing those medical issues, they could also just be uh, waking up from stomach pain. We exactly. know that a lot of children on the spectrum have gut issues. And when David woke up in the middle of the night, sometimes we gave him, we call it a busker pan. I don't know what you find in America, but that would just be like a muscle relaxant to um, help his tummy cramps. That would also help him um, get back to sleep. But, you know, do speak to your pediatrician or doctor about what possible causes could be. It's not okay for your child not to sleep. Something is happening. And another thing you can discuss with your doctor is melatonin. Your, mm -hmm. Our bodies naturally make melatonin. And if um, the child's body is not making enough melatonin, they're going to struggle to fall to sleep and stay to sleep. What worked for David for many years um, was when we gave him slow release melatonin. And that would really keep him to sleep. When you're not sleeping, you can't make informative decisions yeah. and everything feels so much worse than what it really is don't forget that so really let's work on getting everyone in the family to have a good night's sleep now can you share the details of a child's case you worked with at card that inspired you the most yes that's a hard one to think of just one specific <laughs> case that inspires me the most um i do have a recent case that um, you know, on a daily basis, just kind of motivates me. I met with this family probably October of last year. You know, they told me that he had tantrums all day. You know, things, he was five. Um, he had tantrums all day. If he didn't get what he wanted, you know, the tantrums would happen um, 
and it would be very intense, you know, screaming, crying, throwing, aggression, all of that. He also, you know, had a communication device, but didn't really know how to use it. And parents didn't know how to teach him how to use it. Um, you know, they told me they weren't really sure how much he understood because they would tell him things and, you know, he didn't, wouldn't always answer or respond or do what they tell him. So we started ABA, um, you know, focusing a lot on that communication, teaching him to use his device. We worked on compliance. Um, we worked on trying to improve his, in, his um, receptive language skills. And I worked with his parents um, weekly to make sure that, or to provide that parent training to make sure they were able to do what we were doing at home as well. Um, you know, October, he didn't know how to use his Dynavox. And now he is able to tell us what he wants. He's able to tell us what he wants or tell us things about himself that we never taught him. He will tell us when he has a toothache, you know, and we never told wow. him, we never taught him, you know, what a toothache was or where it was or how to get there. And he will tell us like, you know, when he has a toothache, um, you know, he'll, he's starting to tact things like, you know, he'll ask for us to sing specific songs. Um, so he is so much, he's able to get all these things met that, you know, five months ago, he was not able to do. Um, I, talking to his parents recently you know they he doesn't even have a tantrum every single day anymore um and they're able to actually work on behaviors and skills and you know desensitizing him and working on his inflexibility now because they're not dealing with those tantrums every single day anymore um and it's just given them the energy to be able to work on, you know, the little things that in the past they would not have been able to work on. So, you know, just seeing how much he's picked up in just a few months and seeing the time and effort or pay off for his parents and seeing how happy they are now um, is, it's very, very, it's the, the reason why, you know, I do what I do. And I know why a lot of people, a lot of us do what we do is and that we're making a change in this family's life. That's a very, very inspiring story. It's very, very heartwarming. And um, just thank you for all the wonderful work that you do in changing the lives of so many families. Um, it's so inspiring and motivating to hear you um, tell the story. And um, I hope that it gives many parents listening today the encouragement and the hope uh, to know that things really can get better. That, that's a beautiful story. Now, what message would you like to share for World Autism Awareness Month? To April marks World Autism Awareness Day, the month of April. Everyone's talking about autism and we know what's the latest statistics coming from America? Oh, gosh, I'm not caught up on the latest statistics. I want to say it's one in like 30 something. Yeah, I think you're right. You know, I must also double check on it. But, you know, isn't it just unbelievable to think that there's so many children receiving this diagnosis? Uh, 10 years ago, when I started, I believe it was one in 100. You know, oh. and now I think it's actually one in like 44, if I'm yes. actually remembering correctly. Yes. Um, so yes, that's a big, big difference. Um, you know, I've, I've actually thought about like, why, why is the rate or why is the prevalence rate increasing so quickly? And I think a lot of it does have to do with awareness. Um, I've, you know, spent 10 years now um, working with these kids. And honestly, they still amaze me every day. You know, they work so hard every day. They are the hardest workers that I know. Um, mm -hmm. You know, everything that they do, we take for granted for, you know, everything they do is work for them. And we, you know, it just comes so naturally for us. So we don't really realize how difficult it is for them to, you know, do these very simple daily things. Um, and so, um, and there's still so much that we don't know and understand about autism. So I'm hoping that with World Autism Awareness, you know, 
in the future, we won't need something like this because we will have more understanding of what this really, what autism really is. And, um, you know, people will be able to get the, the services that they need. Um, and I really, I think we should, you know, just continue to help them to reach their potential. You know, that's always a goal, help them reach their potential. But I think it's also, um, important that we try to help create a more inclusive world for them. I think it is a little hypocritical for us to expect them to adjust and be flexible to social norms. And if we're re refusing to uh, be flexible with what their needs are as well. Yeah. Um, I agree. So we have so many um, schools in South Africa who aren't inclusive and won't consider including children on the spectrum. And I'd really like to see that change. Yeah. And, you know, to parents, to you guys, you know, you're also amazing. You know, I personally can't pretend or even act like I know what it's like for you guys every single day to know what you're feeling or what your worries are or, you know, the thoughts that consume you. Um, but I do know that every single parent that I've worked with just love their children and want what's best for them. Um, and, you know, I just want parents to give themselves grace and be patient with themselves because you know at the end of the day you guys are also still human and you know it's hard to try to be perfect every single day so yes that, that's a lovely message and from my side um I want parents to have hope I want them to know that it can get better your child can potty train they will sleep through the night they will learn to eat a variety of foods and you will hear their voice. They will learn to communicate and there is a future. As profoundly autistic as David is because of ABA, today he works with a chef every morning and he can peel potatoes and vegetables and he makes soups and pizzas and he has a purpose. So, um, you know, I've already watched the movie of autism. I know what's going to happen and I've experienced the worst case scenario with David. And then my younger son, you know, he's at school and he's um, coping with a great curriculum and he can make friends. And so I've also seen thousands of children in between um, my two kids. And so there is so much hope and an ABA program can go a long way in teaching children the functional skills that they need to become independent uh, human beings. And so there's so much that can be done. Um, my message my message to parents is please do not despair. And I just want to thank you. It is such an honor and a privilege for our South African team to receive your training and your oversight. We feel incredibly lucky to have you as part of our team. It's been um, amazing and fun just working with you guys. And as someone who has personally met Aaron, um, it's amazing the the growth and progress that he's made as well, just seeing where he is now and knowing or hearing about where he started. Yeah, well, it's been wonderful to chat to you today. Thank you so much. And I can't wait to share our conversation with our listeners today. Um, with April marking World Autism Awareness Month, we want to uh, parents and professionals to know that there is so much hope, there, is, there are so many treatment options, and really ABA can go a long way in helping your child acquire those skills that maybe you thought were unimaginable. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Of course. Thank you.